Okay. Well, it's one o'clock, and because all you folks are here on time, I think we should start. <laughs> I want to welcome you to this uh, Forestry Friday. This is a program we started, oh, a year or so ago. Uh, instead of having Saturday workshops, which people don't like to give up Saturdays, uh, we thought there may be people more willing to come out on a Friday afternoon. And uh, it's, it's worked out pretty good. We've had a number of ones on um, tree ID and a number of type of topics. My name is Jonathan Kays. I'm an extension forester with the University of Maryland Extension. And uh, Paul Geringer, he's with the University of Maryland Extension, the uh, Ag Law Institute. And Jennifer Smith. Oh, Jennifer. I keep, I keep five Jennifer Smith in my mind, but uh, is here with, um, uh, with Ground Up. It's her consulting company. She's worked a lot with uh, landowners in Virginia, and she'll tell you a little about what she does in terms of communications. Uh, Paul's going to talk about estate planning uh, in general at the, near the end. And I'm going to just talk a little bit about, start this off about, you know, planning your forest you know, for, the, for the future. And uh, some things you might want to consider. Uh, just uh, whoever's been here before? Who's been here? Okay. Okay. Any folks been here before? Okay. A couple. This is actually, uh, this is actually an, old, um, uh, an old army base uh, from, the, from the 50s. Uh, it was a Nike, uh, it was a communications base. There was, there was uh, antennas all over the place everywhere, and in that center building was a radio building. This was a barracks. Soldiers stationed here up until the 60s. It was called Fort Ritchie Site B. <coughs> if you look up on, uh, so it's connected with a larger number of Fort Ritchie facilities. Uh, the university took it over in the 70s, um, and now it's a 500-acre ag experiment station, you know, extension facility. Who here knows what extension is? University of Maryland Extension. <clears throat> you hear the name, you kind of wonder about it. <clears throat> Just a short two-minute platform speech. Uh, you, the University of Maryland Extension is basically part of the land-grant university system. And the land-grant university system was established by President Lincoln with the Morrill Act in 1862. And what it did is it gave land to each of the states to establish an agricultural college. Um, because up to that time, the only people who went to college, you know, were people that had money and, and wealth, you know, for law and philosophy, to establish an agricultural college where people could learn about, about agriculture and about how to grow things because we were an agrarian uh, nation. Uh, so that's where the University of Maryland College Park started. Uh, each, each state has a land-grant university, uh, Morgantown, WVU, Virginia Tech, uh, Penn State, State College, and so on and so forth. Uh, what they passed on later was the Hatch Act, which uh, basically established the Agricultural Experiment Station, federal funding for the agricultural experiment stations around the nation, providing money for facilities like this where they could do actual research, have facilities to do agricultural research. Um, and then in 1914, the Smith-Lever Act was, was, was uh, established, uh, passed to provide federal funds for outreach because, you know, you have all these people going to campus to learn about agriculture. You have this research. How do you get it out to the people that need it? And that was done through uh, the Agricultural Extension Service. And basically every county in the country, pretty much, or a regional facility, has an outreach uh, through the land-grant university to provide uh, education, uh, research-based education on um, agriculture, um, family consumer science, uh, which used to be uh, called um, uh, home ec and then 4-H youth development. So this facility is part of the extension outreach that we do. Um, a number of, th of us that are here are work in areas where there's, uh, uh, I'm in forestry, we have uh, someone in farm management, and we provide a lot of support for the county extension offices and do programs. So uh, my job in particular is to work with the uh, woodland owners uh, on management, um, and this program is kind of part of a larger, out, larger outreach on estate planning, uh, getting folks to think about how they can, what they can do with their property in the future. So does that make, now you know what extension is? <clears throat> so it's part of the land grant systems, which has three parts. It has the campus-based research and teaching. It has the agricultural experiment stations, where a lot of the research takes place. And then it has the outreach to, to extension. So there'll be a test on that later. Okay. <laughs> So what I want to do, first of all, um, like I said, three parts we're dividing this into. I'm going to talk a little bit about, you know, kind of planning for your woodland. How many folks here um, have a forest stewardship plan on their property? <coughs> okay. Um, so um, how many folks here own, like, less than 50 acres of land? Okay. And over, over 50, of course, we others. 
Okay, so we have a kind of a mix of, of land ownerships here. Um, so some of this you'll recognize, but this is kind of paint the picture about what types of resources are available and to get you thinking a little bit about you know, legacy in the future. And uh, we provided you this publication, um, which you'll find uh, It's Your Legacy, uh, which has uh, some contact information on the back, but it's meant to be kind of a um, easy to understand look at various um, you know, legacy options for landowners, helping folks understand estate planning and so on. Uh, Jennifer is going to come in and talk about communications and strategies and things that she's learned working with other landowners that can help you. And then Paul's going to come and talk about some estate planning basics. And that should take us up through about 4 o'clock or so and um, time for some questions and probably be done by 4.30. And I think we have a break in there as well for a few minutes. We have some drinks in the back with the cookies. And uh, so that's where we're at right now. Okay, so we'll just kind of get going. This is a small, nice small group, and if you have a question, just raise your hand, and we'll deal with it. Um, this is a short video we have I just want you to take a look at. Your land is part of your legacy. Whatever drove you to purchase it, a place to raise your family, beauty, privacy, an investment, something to pass on. The fact is, your land represents more than just a dollar value. There's an emotional attachment to it, not just for you, but probably for your family. What happens to your land is up to you, so there are some important decisions to make. Take the Millers. Bob Miller has always loved snowmobiling. Kay Miller loves birds and spending quiet mornings taking walks on their trails. Now, they're approaching retirement and thinking about what will happen to their land after they die. Who will own it? How will it be used? They'd like to preserve it and not have it fall into a developer's hands where it could be turned into a housing development, and they'd like to leave it to their kids. At the same time, they want to ensure that the value of the land is available to them if they need it in retirement, and can be distributed equally among their children when they're gone. It sounds complicated, this business of making everyone happy. Unfortunately, for couples like the Millers, it can lead to indecision, inaction, and outcomes they don't want. Family arguments, the land being developed, even legal battles, hard feelings and resentments that can linger for years. They've seen these decisions tear other families apart. What you may not know is that protecting your land is easier than you think. It's even possible to protect one portion of your land while allowing another portion to provide income or options for the kids. For example, Bob and Kay could place a conservation easement on the land preventing future development and preserving its natural condition forever, while also setting aside three house lots that can be sold in the future. The house lots can provide income if needed later in life or be given to the kids. They'll even get a tax deduction for donating the easement to a land trust or the community. Of course, this is just one option out of many that will allow you to pass your land on, meet your financial goals, and ensure it isn't used for something you don't want. Bob and Kay are exploring their options. You owe it to yourself and your heirs to explore your options too. It's your land. Don't let it be the cause of fighting in your family. Take steps now to determine its future and your legacy. To start exploring your options, contact your local extension office today. You might be surprised at what you can do to ensure your legacy and just how straightforward the process can be. All right. Like that, it's kind of short and to the point. Had a hard time finding somebody who could write that fast. But uh, so, so when you we're talking here a lot about succession, you know, succession planning, legacy planning, and I'm a forester. So when I think about succession, this is the kind of succession I think about. Is about what happens to land when you leave, when you abandon it, or it goes back in and goes back into forest land. You know, starts as a field, and ends up at some point as a mature forest. And the point here is to make you clear that you know, your land is changing whether, whether you do anything to it or not. Um, and there's a lot of reasons people have for managing their land. And we've heard some of these things. I'm going to turn this light off here. So recreation, quality of life, habitat, economic uh, incentives, there's a lot of different reasons. And of course, there's a major reason as well is just we know that in, in, in terms of policy, the best way to protect water quality or enhance water quality is through, is through forests. And a lot of 
familiar with a lot of what's happening with uh, water quality to Chesapeake Bay, and we know that nitrogen, phosphorus, and sediment is um, reduced when we go into forest land. You know, it's much lower values in terms of what comes off the land. So uh, keeping land in forest is a real net positive for sure on the Chesapeake Bay watershed. And we know that forest cover, you know, dropped in the 1800s, but pretty much is kind of fairly level at this point, maybe dropping a little bit. Um, but with the forest that you see out there today on your land, you have to realize, has a long history. And it's changed a lot. Uh, what you see out there today, uh, you can see it from a plane. You see all those squares here? Why, what, where, does that, where do those come from, you think? What do you think, what do you think has happened there on the land? Huh? Yeah, okay, but, but why does it have all this layout like this with squares and things like this? Yeah, so these are old farm fields, right? And, you know, nature's not big in producing squares, right? <laughs> so the point is that most of the land that we're looking at has really been totally shaped by human activity of one form or another, either from past farming or from, uh, you know, harvesting and things like that. You know, we don't have uh, primeval forests uh, in this area. And we see that happens from the 1800s, uh, where land pretty much the 1850s uh, in the state of Maryland, most of the land was cleared. In fact, you could be in Baltimore and pretty much look, go all the way to Frederick and barely see a tree. I mean, that's how cleared the land was. If it wasn't cropped, it was uh, pastured, you know, maybe with some trees in it. But for the most part, the land has grown back from that. And, uh, you know, in the 1850s, in the more remote areas, you know, with the invention of the uh, steam engine, uh, you know, wood was extracted from the mountainous areas of the state and throughout the country, in fact, in West Virginia, New York, and everywhere else. And we had the CNO Canal and the railroad. Railroad got to Baltimore uh, in eight, or into uh, Cumberland in 1850, at the same time pretty much the CNO Canal did. And that started this industrial age that basically built our cities from wood. Um, and uh, of course, they would burn down a few times and we'd rebuild them. <laughs> but all that wood came off the land and uh, with the Industrial Revolution. And in the return of the 20th century, people were very concerned about the forest because they were basically just being cut down for pretty much exploitative reasons. You know, there wasn't a whole lot of management going on or any concern about regeneration. And that's where most of your state forestry agencies started. Uh, and the, National, the Forest Service and National Parks in the early, early 1900s. Uh, most of the state forestry agencies, like the DNR Forest Service, started as wildfire organizations because of all the cutting that had taken place in the late 1800s and early 1900s, basically these places caught on fire from all the steam, the sparks from steam engines. And you'd have these massive fires and burn areas. And so the state nursery in, in a lot of states were started basically for reforestation. And they had a lot of forest fire crews. And it was only in the, about the 1950s or so, uh, they started offering you know, woodland services to forest landowners like yourselves, where they would actually come out and do a forest stewardship plan this is where a lot of your conservation agencies uh, started as well in the early, late 18, early 1900s, and the developing science of forestry and wildlife management. So the land that we look at, you know, from Baltimore to Frederick, you know, this is what it probably looked like in the early 1900s, and that's what it looks like now. So um, many people, when you look at your land, the point is that what you're seeing there is many probably cleared at least once for agriculture, if not more than that. And then it's come back from, um, been, uh, come back into uh, a vegetation and probably been a number of harvests along the way. So it may be in good shape, it may not. Um, and we know that uh, we look at forests across the state of Maryland, uh, a, lot more state, a lot more forests in the western part of Maryland and the southern region, eastern shore. And then we have this you know, sporadic region throughout the central part of the state where um, but most of it, who, who do you think owns most of the forest land in the state of Maryland? Take a guess. She says private owners who? Parkland? Any ideas? Anybody wants to go on the limb? Huh? State of Maryland? Well, in fact, that's what a lot of people think. But the state of Maryland is basically divided up into various regions that have different types of forests. So when you, we're right around here, right here in the Town area. We have the sandy coastal plain, the Piedmont, and the mountainous regions of the state. And the forests change when you go from one place to the other. When you're up in Garrett County, you know, long winters, cooler temperatures, uh, different types of forests, down to the Piedmont, 
where we are pretty much now, a lot more yellow poplar and things like that. And then you get into the coastal plain areas with a lot more pine forest, okay? Higher water tables, uh, sandier soils, things like that. And that affects what grows there. Uh, and the fact is, most of the forest land is really owned by private landowners, uh, about 72%. And many people think it's the state owns most of the land, but that's really not true because most people, where do most people go recreate? You go to a state park or, or state forest. And, uh, but really, it's the individual decisions of folks like yourself that really decide what happens to the forests of Maryland or most any state, especially in the East Coast. And who owns those forests? Well, actually, about 85% of those ownerships are in parcels that are probably under nine, from one to nine acres. And from you know, smaller numbers of uh, owners for larger parcels, but still a significant amount of the acreage. So, um, and that's occurred because primarily because of development, especially over the last 20 years, as these ownerships have gotten broken up. And that's one reason for concern about you know, the future of your the legacy of your woodland. You have a larger parcel of land to preserve it or keep it intact. How does that happen? So the point is the future of Maryland's forest depends on stewardship decisions made by over 155,000 woodland owners with fairly diverse objectives. Okay? It used to be a lot of properties were in farms and larger properties. A lot of them now are in smaller parcels that have been broken up. And some of you own those, you know, 20 acres, 50 acre parcels. They were probably broken over uh, off of larger, larger ownerships. And uh, so the question becomes, you know, how do you help landowners make informed decisions? And that's what we try and do in extension. And uh, we do that a lot through this, encouraging this idea of woodland stewardship. You know, knowing, having a sense of responsibility and the fact that you folks are here probably indicates that, you know, you, you feel that sense of responsibility. Not, you want to make sure that your land is taken care of. Knowing the opportunities and aware of the consequences of your actions and guided by some type of objectives. And um, so the, um, there's a couple of myths that are out there about forestry. Uh, and leaving the woods alone is the best option for wildlife, forest health, and environmental or ecosystem protection. Well, as we know, with a lot of things that have happened with um, you know, invasive species and, and all the other, all the other imp impacts on our forests, that, that may be the right option. But you know, until you have your woodland looked at by a, by a forestry professional, and know what the opportunities are, and know what the consequences are of taking various actions, I wouldn't want to jump to that conclusion. And that's the whole idea behind getting a, you know, an assessment by a professional forester in terms of a stewardship plan. And I'll tell you a little bit about what that means. The other thing is managing woodlands takes a lot of time and money. Well, not, not necessarily, because uh, actually Maryland is pretty blessed that we have state foresters who will write forest stewardship plans for $250 for plan that's good for 10 to 15 years. Most states don't have those resources. It would cost a lot more to get that done. And there's also private consulting foresters and others that you can work with and hire to do things with, like marketing timber and, and doing other things. And there's a lot of incentive programs. Uh, who here is familiar with cost share programs? You know what the term cost share program means? In other words, there's certain practices the government wants to encourage. Uh, good stewardship practices, so they'll pay a portion of the cost for a, a thinning or a tree planting and stuff like that. So it makes it more of an incentive for landowners to do those things. And my woodlands are too small. Well, um, again, a lot of these programs go down to smaller acreages. So, you know, is leaving the forest alone best for wildlife and forest health and diversity? Well, you know, again, we have all these things that are impacting deer, okay, browse line there. This was a 100-acre area killed by gypsy moth, okay? Multiflora rose and Atlantis and southern pine beetle, you know? So being aware of what's happening on your property can help you avert, you know, some type of negative impact if you can act quickly enough. So forest health and basic, who knows what this is? Any idea? This grass, all this... Yeah, Japanese stilt grass. How about this? That's actually kudzu. So that's very, we're not really kudzu, maybe a little in southern Maryland, but what about this one? Phantas. <clears throat> okay, and this? It's hard to see, but it's actually barberry. Yeah, but it could be multiple rows. <laughs> and then, of course, we have this guy here. 
emerald ash borer, right? I mean, basically, emerald ash borer has eliminated ash trees from our woodlands. It's, they're falling down. I mean, they're dead. They're just haven't, some haven't fallen yet. Yeah. This is, um, I think that's the walnut twig beetle, isn't it? I'm not sure. This I know is, you know, hemlock woolly adelgid. It's impacted hemlock. So there's all these things out there. So the whole point is, you know, knowing kind of what's going on in your property is, is a real positive thing. And, and that's something that an assessment by a forester can tell you. Now, what you do about it is kind of open, but knowledge is good, you know? Um, and of course, this is deer, major impact. This shows you the impact of what offense, by keeping deer out, the, offense, the, the impact that it can have. And there's a lot of re some research that shows that, you know, if you eliminate deer from an area, that a lot of the native species actually can compete effectively um, with a lot of these invasives. But when, they ch when the deer come in and just chew down, of course, they favor the native species, it just, you know, it makes it an impossible situation. So, um, you know, harvesting adequate numbers of deer off a property is always a positive, positive thing. Um, and again, this whole interaction with wildlife, you know, creating habitat for wildlife. If you want certain types of wildlife, you need those various types of habitat, various successional stages of vegetation. And you can create these by good management. Either by, I always say, like, it's one of three things we do in forestry, okay? It's we cut, some, we cut or kill something, we plant something, or we do nothing at all. <laughs> and we call them different things. You know, we call them harvesting, we call it thinning, we call it tree planting. But, you know, we're doing one of those three things. And we actually are manipulating forest succession in a way that we can encourage certain types of wildlife. Uh, and thinning. You know, thinning is the idea of basically taking out your poor quality trees and leaving your better trees to grow. Which ones do you take out? Again, you know, if you don't, if you don't get some good advice, in many cases, uh, the tendency is if you have someone come in and harvest on your property, they're going to take the biggest and the best trees unless you have a professional forester work with you so that you select, typically you want to select the poor quality trees so that they are the ones that are gone and you put the growth in the remaining good quality trees. And uh, this, you know, this, this opening, this can't be lets light in faster in diameter. And uh, just to show you a difference, this is a couple of tree cookies here from an oak forest, okay? So at this point in the forest growth, this part of the forest was thin, all right? leaving certain numbers of trees to leave. This was not. So after 26 years, that's how much those, those trees grew in diameter. All right? The other part, that's how much it grew. So thinning can really you know, encourage vigorous growth of trees. And that's what you want. You know, I always say that trees are like people. So when are you going to be, are you going to be more healthy when you're out there exercising every day or when you sit on the couch every day? So it's the same with trees. You know. If they're growing vigorously, they have light, they can grow, they're going to be more likely to ward off insects and disease and things like that. So, uh, and what we want to avoid is high grading. Basically, this is a practice where you just, and, and you take the biggest and the best trees, you leave the rest, and typically what happens is it just turns into a big mess, and you end up more or less with what's a clear cut, uh, or most of the trees die. And this is why you want to have professional forestry systems when you do a, a timber harvest. You know, someone knocks at your door, um, not saying they're a good or a bad logger. I'm just a harvester. I'm just saying that you want to know exactly what's being harvested and make sure you exactly know that your, your interests are protected. And a professional forester can help you with that decision. So, so planning for your forest land now and in the future, uh, this is one point of contention that I think is a little confusing for some people. They, they get confused with taxes, okay? So there's property taxes. So, for those of you who have a stewardship plan or an agriculture, you get a current use assessment, right? You're in, um, you're in a woodland assessment plan, or your, your, your property has a lower property tax rate because it's an agriculture, right, for many people. And people say, they, they make this mistaken impression that, well, that's what my property's worth. You know, that's not what your property's worth. And when you pass on and property goes to your future heirs, or to, uh, basically it's assessed at the market value of the property. So don't be confused by that. And then there's the whole thing of timber taxes, that if you sell timber, uh, you want to make sure that you treat it as capital gains. And what that means is that if you, who here is a relatively new to forest ownership? Anybody? Okay. 
So the one thing you really want to do, if you have a relatively property you haven't owned for long or you inherited recently, is to have a forester come in and do a, a do a, calculate the basis of the timber of the property. If there's some decent, if there is decent timber on it, so you separate the land value from the timber value, so that if you harvest timber, you get to subtract off the basis, and you're only paying taxes on what's above the basis value. Is that confusing, kind of? You're only paying you're only paying taxes on the growth. Now, if you've owned the property for 40 years, <laughs> most of what you see out there is probably growth that's occurred since you took the property or owned the property. But just the point is that a common mistake people make when they sell timber is that they claim it as regular income. You want to claim it as capital gain after one year and you want to subtract the basis. So if you have property and you're not sure, we can follow up with you, but um, to have a forester calculate the basis of the timber value. And that's going to help you pay less money to the government. And then there's the whole estate tax thing in terms of passing on to your areas that we're really focusing on here today. Um, so first of all, you know, get out and enjoy your woods. Uh, we're blessed to have a number of good uh, professional forestry assistance organizations in Maryland and on the East Coast in general. Um, you know, make informed decisions, uh, improve wildlife habitat, you know, avoid conflicts. And the first part of that is having a plan. So how many folks here said they have a written forest stewardship plan? <coughs> okay. So if you don't, you know, I really encourage you to get one. Um, and I'll tell you about that. But basically, there's different types of licensed professional foresters. There's, um, there's state foresters with the DNR Forest Service. There's one in each county. And if you go to our website, which you'll see on that piece of paper that's on there, you can go to our website, extension.umd.edu slash woodland. You'll, you can find these folks, and they'll come out, and they'll actually do a forest stewardship plan for your property for somewhere, depending on the acreage, around $250. And that plan is good for about um, you know, 10 to 15 years. So the other types of foresters are private consulting foresters. And these are basically private contractors. Uh, if you're going to have any type of a timber sale done or things like that, commercial sale, then you would hire this person to represent your interests on the, in that sale. And they usually charge 10 to 15%. Uh, but they make up more for it because they make sure that you have the right harvester to make sure the roads and erosion and sediment control stuff is all taken care of, which can get you into big trouble <laughs> if it's not done right. And, uh, you know, they're basically acting as you're on your, for representing your interests in a sale. <clears throat> okay, that's the other type of foresters, industrial foresters. So industrial foresters are ones that work for a specific mill. And the only thing I would say about there's good industrial foresters, but just remember they're representing the interests of the mill. And they may even offer some free services, but they're not being paid to represent your interests. So for most landowners, and this is not to denigrate anybody, just to say to protect you, you usually recommend to landowners that we have a list of licensed professional foresters in the state of Maryland, people that have credentials. And uh, I, would, I would tend to use one of those to represent your interests. Yeah. Good question. Yeah. And then, of course, we have the best foresters of all. <coughs> which are your extension foresters, of which we have, oh, maybe two. <laughs> Three. So, uh, but our goal is really education, outreach, and information, things like that. So what's in a plan? This is an example of a plan for a piece of property uh, actually owned by, by uh, I think, uh, a nonprofit down in central Maryland, Upper Marlboro. And the plan typically costs $200 to $275. $200, There's a cost share. Uh, type available for developing plans as well uh, if you want to use a private contractor. And if you want to know more about that, I can tell you. But this just shows you kind of what's in the plan. This is just a real brief view to kind of show you what's in a plan and why have one. But it explains the, where the property is, about the objectives of the landowner. And then it has a map. This is the most important thing, because what the forester does, they go out into all this forest land here. They lay out plots, take inventory and sample plots. And then they develop this into st different stands. There's like five or six of them there. And these are areas that are similar enough they can be managed as a unit. You know, they're like the same type of species, the same age, and stuff like that. So in this case, you can see all these numbers here. It might be a little hard to see. A lot of that is farmland as well. But just looking close up, number one is around this riparian area. This is stand number two. 
stand number three. So these areas are similar enough they can be managed as a unit. And that comes from doing field data, taking field data. That's what the forester does. And it might read something like this. It gives a description of the stand, the area, the species, and the understory, the age, the stocking. Is it well stocked or is it growing well? And uh, then they recommend some practices. Uh, this one is composed of tulip poplar, sweet gum, sycamore, and uh, good growth, growth potential. And the recommendation is basically to maintain the riparian area and manage invasive plants and increase buffer size. And that the WIP and QUIP are basically the names of cost share programs that are out there that you as a landowner can access. And the, land, and the, heart, and the state forester will actually help you with that process to access those cost share programs. So that's the other advantage you have working with the state forester. And then this is the, another stand. This is stand two here. That was stand one along the riparian area. This is stand two. Again, tulip poplar, and it's relatively large solid in there. It's over 12 inches in diameter, so it's a, a larger trees. Excellent growth potential. And the recommendation there is to do some type of a commercial timber harvest, thinning out what's there to allow those remaining trees to grow, work with the consultant forester, designate the trees, and, and that kind of thing. So you're getting some sound advice out of this is what it comes down to. And uh, at the end, you have a, a you know, practice schedule for the next you know, 10 years or so, saying these are things that you, could, you can do you know, and areas that you should do them. And this isn't written in stone. You, know, you can change this, but this is, a, this is a roadmap, okay? That's basically what this is. This is a roadmap, all right? Any questions on that? It's a, a quick, I know I'm just covering some stuff real quick, but so there are some cost share programs out there. The State Forestry Service has one They're called the Woodland Incentive Program. The federal program is through the Natural Resource Conservation Service. And I'm not going to go into any details on this, just except to say that there is, you know, significant amounts of funding, 65, 75 percent, sometimes more, to help pay for a practice where you're not getting income from that practice, like tree planting, something like that. And uh, these are all types of practices, invasive species control. They will actually pay you to do it, or you can pay a contractor to do it. Uh, who here has sold timber before? Sold, okay. Is that a largely a positive experience, or <clears throat> did you use a consulting forester? Or? <laughs> yeah, so I mean, we have a publication on this called Marketing Forest Products. It's on our website. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail, just to say that the best results we see with most landowners is when they have the landowner not dealing directly with the logger, unless you're experienced. You know, you know what needs to be done and how to protect your interests. The best way is to work with a consulting forester to represent your interests in this triangle. Um, that's, that's the general recommendation. That's nothing against uh, other types of foresters. It just seems it works better that way. And usually the, t the sale, the timber is put out on bid. Um, you know, it could be a local mill, it could be an independent logger, a dealer, a firewood operator. Again, that's something that a consultant can help you negotiate that. Typically what they'll do is they'll put out a, they'll measure the trees that are going to be cut. They'll create a bid statement that says there's so many, these are the species, this is the diameter of the trees, this is how much volume there is of the trees, this is the conditions of the sale, and they'll send it out to a large number of people who are potential buyers. They'll say, if you want to see what's going to be sold, I'll meet you at the property this day. And then they tend to say, if it's a big enough sale, I'll take sealed bids by 5 o'clock on the 24th. And they could be faxed in, they could be mailed in, whatever. And so it's a bidding. They bid against each other at sealed bids, so they don't know what each other is bidding. And a lot of the research shows that uh, by using that type of process, you, you get much more money and cut a lot fewer trees. <laughs> so, uh, that being said, there are some timber market reports that may give you an idea of what timber is worth. Uh, we used to have one of these, but uh, Pennsylvania has one of the best ones right now, Pennsylvania Extension. And you can get that off of our website when you go to stumpage prices. Uh, I'm going to skip through this. So you want to work for your forester. Um, get a stewardship plan first is usually the best thing. And then use a consulting forest to market your timber. Um, the best way is to get a referral from somebody else or uh, ask for some uh, names of some references, of clients they worked with. Um, 
talk with a few on the phone, make sure you feel comfortable with them representing your interests. And most of them will come out and do a visit to the property, at least initially, and uh, you can kind of go from there. So uh, there's also this whole idea of non-timber forest products, uh, which is you know, fairly popular in some ways. Every, we did a lot of work with growing ginseng and all kinds of stuff like that. Okay, the tax incentive, uh, there, most of you are, uh, who here is in the Woodland assess, Tax Assessment Program, or do you know you are? Okay, who here is an agricultural assessment? Okay, the other option in many cases is the woodland assessment. And this is open to any woodland owner who has more than five acres of woodland. And this is a separate assessment program, okay? And it's fro basically it freezes your, um, your, your tax assessment at um, a lower rate. So, um, for example, you have to have at least five acres. And the first is, is what's called a forest conservation and management agreement. I don't recommend that option for people because it's like a 15-year... Uh, uh, agreement that's tied to your deed. And, it's, and your, your assessment's frozen at like $115 an acre or something like that. But the other option they provide is the forest stewardship plan where you get a forest stewardship plan developed and then you take it down to the county assessor and then you get taxed $187 an acre. And the fact is that for many people, some people who are in counties that are paying ag assessment, if that ag assessment is based on your soil type and soil quality, in many cases, people are paying more under an ag assessment than they might pay under this $187 an acre for a woodland assessment. So that's something to check. What is the rate you're paying? It might be worth it for you to get a stewardship plan for the, for the woodland property, part of the property. Does that make sense? Because many times, uh, some, not all the counties, many counties is pretty low, but some counties you could be paying four to five hundred dollars an acre on ag land as an assessment. So it's worth checking into that. Um, and there's also other income uh, tax modifications for planting trees and things like this. Um, and I just want to talk a little bit to, to, on the way out here is about different types of protection. So many folks go to a lot of effort to get a forest stewardship plan to practice and be good stewards of the property. And the question is, you know, how do I assure that my wishes extend into the future? And a conservation easement is really one way to really make that happen. It's one of the few ways that you have to basically assure that your wishes for the land are going to be, um, uh, going to be represented. So uh, and what that means is that uh, this is an agreement with a landowner and a land trust or government agency. It permanently limits use the land to protect its conservation values while the landowner continues to grow it. Basically what it is, you're either donating or you're selling the development rights of the property. And depending on whether you donated or paid for it, um, then you can deduct that from, your ta from taxes and things like that. But this, is, this assures that the land is still owned by your heirs. It's just that it's gonna stay based on the wishes of, of, of you. And that little video we showed, in many cases there's all types of arrangements in many cases, you can assure, arrange for like a certain number of house lots on the property, you know, for future heirs and things like that. Um, but it takes a lot of the development value out of the property. It can't be developed. So whoever buys that property, basically the conservation easement goes with it in perpetuity. Does that make sense? So um, it's the one sure way to make sure your stewardship objectives. And one thing that's come in the state of Maryland is we've worked on them as well. In many cases, you can actually require that there be a forest stewardship plan uh, associated with the conservation easement. So that some of your objectives and requiring that the landowner, future landowner, actually have a forest stewardship plan. So they're going to be getting some forestry assistance. So, and the way, easiest way to explain the conservation easement is this bundle of sticks idea. And when you have property, it's, it's kind of like a bundle of sticks, a bundle of uh, various, that represent various rights. So to sell it, you can see here, to lease it, to mortgage it, and then there's other ones to subdivide it, um, and, and, and that type of thing. So really what you're doing is you have this fee simple land before the value, you have certain development rights, okay, and you're basically either donating or selling off those development rights. And you're receiving value for that. In other words, if you donate it, um, we have some really good uh, organizations in the state of Maryland, and I'm not going to go into specifics, but 
I think it's like up to 15 years you can write off the value of that property on your income taxes in the future, and there's all kinds of benefits that you would gain as a landowner. Um, so, uh, so conservation easements are donated or purchased, and we always recommend encouraging a forest stewardship plan requirement and uh, you know, making that um, an option. Um, there's a lot of old easements that were out there, and when I first, I've been around 30 years, so back at that time, you know, a lot of the conservation organizations were issuing what was called no-cut easements. In other words, basically the land was, no, was protected and no, no management was allowed. And that's, that's changed a lot. You don't want that. You want to have the option to be able to you know, harvest forest products, use the land, and uh, that's one of the things you really want to make sure that's included in a conservation easement, that you can manage the land. So, of course, the lawyer's involved with this and everything else. So uh, there's a number of programs that are out there uh, for purchase easements in the Maryland. The biggest one, and I think you're in Ag Land, you're in the Maryland Ag Pres Land Preservation Program where you actually are paid for the development value of the property. But it's, it's not a simple system, right? I mean, you have to submit a bid, and it's a fairly involved process, and it depends on available funds in each of the counties and the state and stuff like that. Um, and the other option is uh, donated easements where you get a federal income tax deduction, state income tax credits, and a number of other property tax credits. So again, the, the point is that as a forester, um, I've been around for a while, and I've just come to the conclusion that if, you know, if, if, if there's gonna be parcels of land large enough that can actually be managed for forestry purposes, probably one of the sure ways to make sure that can happen, or for agriculture for that matter, is that land probably should be protected by a conservation easement. Otherwise, you know, once the owner of the property is gone, um, it's, it's more difficult because heirs have then have the control of the property. <laughs> My old saying is, where there's a will, there's a relative. You know, so. <laughs> um, anyway, and I know that um, you're going to talk a little more about this, as is Paul, but just keep this in mind for those of you who, again, who here is uh, not familiar with conservation easements? This is a show of hands. So most, most of you are. You're, 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 you kind of get the idea of what it's about. OK, that's good. So we can kind of move on from there, all right? Uh, so we provided you this publication. Um, and this is meant to be a real common sense guide to estate planning. Um, it's, it's, it's got some information in it, but it's laid out in a way that I think is very user friendly and easy to understand. Uh, we actually developed this in the Northeast Extension Foresters from all the states, and then each of us added a cover and a back on it with our specific state information because all the information in there is pretty much applies to all the states in one way or another in terms of federal taxes and the basic idea of easements and things like that. So that's what I have at this point. Um, what I hoped you got out of this was just kind of an overview of the types of resources that are available now for you as landowners uh, with, with, with professional forestry assistance, with you know, cost share programs that are available if you're, if, you're, if you're interested in that, as well as just kind of uh, some of the implications for um, you know, legacy in terms of things to think about in the future. The, most of the easements in the state of Maryland, um, I think there's over, how many, what, 600,000 acres of, of, of easements in the state of Maryland, something like that. It's, it's, it's a lot. It's, it's one of the highest in the country. Um, and the, most of these are all written by the, or um, they, they have local land trusts that accept the easements, but they're co-signed by the Maryland um, Environmental Trust, which is a quasi-state uh, quasi organization under DNR, Department of Natural Resources. And what that means basically is that they're well protected. One concern about in perpetuity is who's going to enforce this thing 40 years from now? Well, in the state of Maryland, we have the Maryland Environmental Trust, which is a, going to be there uh, to basically make sure that, the, uh, that everything is you know, looked after and is extorted, the stewardship of it. And some states, not necessarily as, as, as well, because uh, some small land trusts are necessarily um, have a more difficult time of assuring that. But in the state of Maryland, if you work with a local land trust uh, in a specific area of the state, almost all of those easements are co-signed by the Maryland Environmental Trust. So you have some assurance that your wishes are going to go into the future. 
So any, any questions? Uh, well, one thing with cost share programs like the Natural Resource Conservation Service with their EQIP program, and this is true with the other cost share programs, you don't have to do it yourself. There is, and you basically can hire a contractor. But you have to pay, the payoff doesn't come until the end. My understanding is, yeah, okay, right, right, if you're investing uh, in, in some practices. So in other words, if they're paying 65% of the cost of a, of, a, of a thinning, where there's really no income from the thinning, yet yeah, you're eating money there until, that, until there actually is a, a timber sale. Right. right. But for a lot of the practices that are here, like tree planting and stuff like that, many of those practices are highly incentivized. And you can basically almost, you can actually pile up what's it called, the stacking uh, program. So actually, I know that for a lot of the tree planting programs, uh, they'll pay for close to 100% of the cost of, of tree plantings. Has anybody here else had a yeah, repairing buffer training? What, was that the case with you? or? Okay. Well, things are different now. I know that the, so for example, the EQIP program, which is the federal program, and the Woodland, uh, Woodland Center program, which is the DNR state program, they can add on to each other. So in many cases, there's very little cost to the landowners, especially tree planting, big focus on tree planting. It's a trimming, right? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, right. So you yeah, basically, with most of these things, the way cost share works is you work with the forester or the, uh, uh, or the, um, the federal uh, soil conservation. They come out to the site. They see what you got. They'll work up a plan and you know, make, you basically submit an application to do the practice. And then it has to be approved by a board uh, or by the organization. And then you go ahead and implement it. But they'll write it up. You'll know pretty much exactly what it's going to, well, close to what it's going to cost. Because there's, yeah, with the tree planting, there's the ceilings, there's the tree shelters, there's the stakes, and there's the, the, the actual lake. All that stuff. So I don't want to move ahead because I want to move on to uh, give Jennifer uh, time here. So thank you very much. And let's, uh, let me just switch.